This is my presentation on lymphography. And lymphography is a study that's not done really that much anymore in flat film radiology. It might be done in some areas, but um, around the area where I live, uh, it's really gone by the wayside. And there's other systems or other modalities now that can actually perform lymphographic type studies um, a lot better. However, from a historic standpoint, I thought it was worth going over uh, just to explain what lymphography is and how it works. Uh, lymphography is a study of the lymphatic system, and lymphangiography is a study carried out um, about one hour post-injection after the injection of the contrast agent, and it's a study of the of the lymph the lymph vessels. And lymphadenography, or lymphadenography, depending on where you're from, I guess, is a study of the lymph nodes themselves. And the lymphatic system moves really slow. So what we have to do in this case is inject contrast and then have the patient come back the next day or stay over in the hospital. And then we can um, do x-rays of their body the next day and we should be able to see their lymph nodes. Okay, uh, the function of the lymphatic system. Well, lymphocytes are cells in the body that help us fight off infection. So lymphocytes are found in the lymphatic system, and if bacteria or viruses or whatever get into the lymphatic system, they kill them. Um, now, the thing is, whenever your, whenever your body... Uh, your blood is flowing through your circulatory system, and part of the circulatory system are the capillaries. And so down in the capillaries, the, the walls of the vessels are very, very thin. And so oxygen and carbon dioxide and nutrients can easily, uh, you know, go back and forth across that boundary. But the carrying fluid of the blood is the plasma. And, you know, you, you think, well, if the if the capillary walls are really thin, then might we leak out some plasma? And the answer to that is yes. And that's the function, the main function of the lymphatic system is to return that fluid that is leaked out of the capillaries back into circulation. Because if that fluid just stays in the if that fluid just stays in the tissue, then you wind up with very edematous tissue. And that happens to people. Um, you know, people that have like CHF or whatever, and they have fluids pooling in their body, they wind up with excess lymphatic fluid in their tissues, and uh, they become very, um, very swollen. Now, lymph, um, it's mostly clear and colorless, and it moves um, like back towards the central part of the body, by diffusion, um, peristaltic activity. When you just walk around, the activity of your muscles uh, compresses the lymphatic vessels and causes, and there's valves in there, so um, it causes the, the lymph to flow back towards the, not really towards the heart, but back towards the central part of the body. And I've got a couple pictures later. I'm gonna show you exactly where the lymph goes back into the circulatory system. Now, there are some lymphatic related organs. Um, the spleen in the, low, in the left upper quadrant of the abdomen, that's considered um, a lymphoid organ. Uh, the tonsils in your throat, those are involved in fighting off disease uh, before it has a chance to get down into your respiratory system. And then your thymus gland, which is located in the mediastinum, it produces a substance called thymosin, which stimulates T cell production. Now, the thymus gland is in the mediastinum, but it's only there through puberty. And so after you're about 20 years old or so, then that thymus gland just mostly, um, you know, it just mostly turns to fat or it just atrophies away. So in, in adults, there is no thymus gland. Okay, the lymphatic vessels. Uh, lymphatic vessels and capillaries, those are the really, really small vessels that are out in the periphery of the body. Uh, there's larger collecting vessels because this thing sort of acts like the circulatory system. As you get back towards the central part of the body, the vessels get larger and larger, although they're not um, 
they're not really big, you know, compared to something like the inferior vena cava or the aorta. Um, they're nowhere near that large. And then we also have lymph nodes throughout the body. And what these, these lymph nodes are, are areas um, where, uh, like the fighting of infection takes place primarily. But they're, they're like gathering points for the lymphatic fluid. Okay, lymphatic system. As we said before, it uh, fights disease, returns proteins back to the blood. Um, the lymphatic fluid, you know, is proteinaceous. Uh, filters lymph, so there's filtration going on in the lymph nodes. And, you know, of course, because you're, you're going to feed this lymph back into central circulation, so you'd like to have it cleaned up as much as possible. And the lymphatic system can also help transfer fats, uh, cholesterols, back into the bloodstream. Okay, uh, swipe this picture from the 2001 version of um, the Mosby radiography book. Okay, lymph, lymph capillaries. Those are located all through your body in all tissues. Um, they pick up the lymphatic fluid, carry it to the larger vessels. There's superficial and deep lymphatic vessels, and they drain into one of two lymphatic ducts. There's one on each side, and um, the right lymphatic duct basically just drains the lymph from the, from the right side of your head, the right side of your chest, and your right arm. It doesn't cover a whole lot of territory. The thoracic duct is more central to your body. It, um, it basically parallels the inferior vena cava traveling up through your body cavity, and it dumps into the left lymphatic duct, and it's characterized by an area called the cisterna chile, which is uh, just like a, a large holding area for lymphatic fluid. Okay, so here's kind of how this thing works. Um, the right side of the body just drains this area in green, and the thoracic duct drains the remainder of the body, uh, which, you know, is by far the bulk of it. Okay, some lymph nodes. You're, you've got lymph nodes in the back of your head, in your neck. They're really all over the place. Uh, when these lymph nodes, if there's infection and they get swollen, um, then you can feel them. Uh, sometimes they even hurt. And in the abdomen, abdomen and pelvis, the lymphatic vessels, um, basically they parallel the large blood vessels. So if you've got if you've got a large vein or artery, chances are there's uh, lymph nodes clustered close to it and larger lymphatic vessels too. Okay, now why would we do any lymphography, lymph lymphographic studies? Well, once upon a time, if people had malignant adenopathy or lymphomas, then the doctor might um, use lymphography to determine where the, the lymph nodes were in order to um, basically get ready for surgery so that he knows where, where to operate. Um, people that have Hodgkin's disease or candidates, people that have lymphosarcoma, that's a very, very dangerous form of lymphatic cancer, cancer of the reproductive glands, um, unexplained peripheral swelling, like if somebody has edema but they don't have uh, congestive heart failure, well, that's suspicious. What's caught? What is causing that? And um, suspected carcinoma. Another thing I don't have here, but we have done um, lymphography in the past, uh, basically to find the upstream lymph nodes that are associated with breast cancer. Some contraindications, reasons why we would not do this stuff. Uh, allergy to contrast or blue dye. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the blue dye in just a minute. Advanced pulmonary disease. If somebody has really bad problems with their lungs, breathing, we don't want them to go into respiratory failure. And um, if somebody has been exposed to large amounts of radiation, then that could be a contraindication.
Oh, uh, just by way of explanation, radiation decreases the filtration rate of the lungs, creating the possibility of fatal complications resulting from an oil embolism. Because we're going to use an oil-based contrast for this. Okay, this is just a CT scan, and this CT scan is just showing some oil embolisms in an 18-year-old Hodgkin's disease patient. All right, the contrast media. This is going to have to be oil-based because it moves so slowly that if we use a water-based contrast agent, uh, it'll get absorbed before we get a chance to see where it went. So we use something like a thiodol or lip iodol. These are uh, iodine-containing oils, and the body will absorb them eventually. It just takes a longer time, so that gives us... Um, it, it extends the amount of time that we have the contrast available to be able to use for our radiographs. Now, the blue dye business. Uh, what the doctor will do is just inject the blue dye, and this stuff is, um, is a really dark color of blue. It's almost like tattoo ink, and they'll inject it into the tissues and then wait a little while to see where the blue dye is going, and that helps identify the lymphatic vessels. Because if you just start poking around with a needle in somebody, your chances of hitting a lymphatic vessel are slim and none. So the blue dye helps the doctor figure out where the radiographic contrast will go. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, this procedure, as I said earlier, it's rarely done anymore. Very rarely. Nowadays we have such good visualization on CT scans that, um, you know, this is pretty much a obsolete procedure. So uh, once, whenever we were doing these lymphographic studies, we needed an automatic injector that injected at an extremely slow rate. There's no way you could inject this slowly by hand um, because the, these vessels, they uptake the, the contrast so slowly um, you know, the, the machine would be able to do it, whereas somebody by hand might not be able to. A uh, tiny, tiny needle, a specialized cannula, this thing would be um, something super small because these vessels are really tiny. And the procedure takes hours. And so this thing would tie up an x-ray room for a while. And here's some example pictures. Uh, I copied this out of Mosby also. And as you can see, um, if you look in this, uh, this image here of the pelvis, you can see where these lymph vessels are feeding into the, the lymph nodes. And the pictures are pretty. Um, a radiologist would be able to, to tell a lot more about it than I can. And this particular picture was made about one hour post-injection, and it shows the tiny lymphatic cells. And so this would be an example of the... Um, uh, what do you call it, uh, lymph angiography. So this, this is like early phase. All right, now this is an example of lymph adenography, and this radiograph supposedly was made 24 hours after injection, and so the, the contrast is still in the lymph nodes, but it's mostly been taken up from the lymphatic vessels. All right, now this is kind of a nasty looking picture. This is um, lymphography showing extravasation from the lymphatic system uh, in a patient with HIV. So HIV is a pretty destructive disease and it can actually um, you know, break down the, um, what do you call it? It can actually break down the lymphatic system and cause it to not be able to contain the lymphatic fluid like it did and so this patient's probably retaining a lot of water. Okay, so I promised that I was going to show you guys where these uh, lymphatic ducts wound up. And as you can see, okay, down here is that cisterna chile I was telling you about. It's um, kind of like a junction of several different lymphatic vessels all coming together. And so it's... Uh, it looks like a big old lymph node. And then this thoracic duct goes right up in front of the spine, in front of the T-spine. 
and it's, you know, here's some more nodes feeding into it. And then, as you can see, it goes right up through here, and right here at the junction of the subclavian vein and the jugular vein, that is where that lymphatic um, fluid is draining back into systemic circulation. So this thoracic duct is over here on this side, and over here the right lymphatic duct kind of does the same thing, and it feeds into the, uh, the junction here at the right jugular and right subclavian. So that's where these two ducts empty back into systemic circulation. Okay, and this is kind of gross. This is a cadaver that's been cut up. And as you can see right here, the, this is the SVC. And the heart should be right here, but it's gone. So in this picture, we've taken out the heart and the aorta and the uh, IVC so that we can see what's going on behind there. And see, this is the thoracic duct. And it goes up and around. And then it empties into the um, into the subclavian slash jugular and over on the right hand side we do not show it looks like we don't have the the right um, the right duct okay and last but not least here is an example of an MRI scan of a patient's lower leg. And in this case, uh, we've got a picture of a 33-year-old man with lymphedema. And in this image, um, we can see that there are slightly enlarged lymphatic vessels in the right leg, if you look where those arrows are. So This is uh, an example of what's possible using MRI. MRI is such a better system for demonstrating soft tissues such as the lymphatic system. However, there's a copay involved, so it's kind of expensive. All right, well, thanks very much for your attention. I appreciate it as always. Um, and uh, I'll be seeing you on my next presentation. And good luck with your radiographic education.